Oh ja, sie haben die Dustin zu Chronicles Show of the Weekends. Uh. So, today we are talking and your questions and answers and all the good stuff, yes. Well, this is the Friday edition. Recorded on Thursday. And I think we're on episode 14, teen, 55, one of those numbers. It's probably one out of four. I've got no clue. So I've been listening to you, and I've heard you. So your answers for this weekend are, uh... From the unsung heroes of war section. They're planning on mothballing the entire fleet of A-10 warthogs. Bad move. This is from our resident ranger buddy. Ranger Brohando Burchado. The entire fleet of AFA-10 warthogs. Warthogs. It's a bad move. I'd rather have one A-10 in the fleet than any number of F-22s and F-35s. I believe the U.S. government would generally like to maintain a DOD present in Afghanistan indefinitely along the lines of South Korea and Germany and Japan. Karzai is just madder than a hatter and isn't playing along. It will all depend most likely on the actions of the new Afghan president, regardless who comes out on top. I am betting on continued U.S. presence in Afghanistan after 2014 and well beyond. Just my take. The lack of a SOFA agreement and lack of political support from the new Afghan regime, post Karzai, from what I know, all the potential Afghan presidents are in favor of signing a SOFA agreement. And continue U.S. presence there. Karzai is just being squirrely, trying to milk his last bit of power and money out of us. Now, whether we do the right thing by the Afghans remains to be seen. I don't really know if Obummer wants to get the fuck out or not. GTFO. I would have to say, most likely he wants to stay as well. So, if the Afghans can play ball and sign the SOFA agreement, it would be hard to justify a wholesale U.S. military pullout. Wouldn't make any sense strategically or politically. That's from our resident ranger. Ranger Speaks! We need to get you a theme song. Something really death metal. It's like chug 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 Ranger Speaks! Chug 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 Ranger Speaks! You know, something like that, some, like, some pig squeals or something, like, you know, kind of shit like that. You know, oh yeah, be pretty freaking ranger. Oh yeah, totally ranger. Dang it, I lost, you know, well, screw it. Military times roulette. When in doubt. Oh god. <laughs> Online copycats take advantage of PFC's flag salute outrage. That's not news. I'm not clicking that. That is ridiculous. I don't know why they would put that on there. Senior defense official, we don't want to cut, we don't want to cut, blame Congress. (laughs) This is great. Whoever came up with that quote is fucking awesome. (laughs) Who actually wrote this? Michelle Tan? A staff reporter at a... At the Military Times, senior defense official, we don't want to cut, blame Congress. A senior defense official says the Army and Defense Department are being unfairly vilified in the media over military budget cuts when Congress is really to blame. Congress is the one that passed the law that put sequestration into place. The senior official told Army Times, because, you know, God forbid we cut anything. I mean, man, you gotta... You gotta milk it for all you got. The high-level official requested anonymity in order to speak candidly. Sequestration is bad. 
we've got to get rid of sequestration. What the army and DOD leadership is trying to do within the constraints is give you the best military we can. We don't want to cut. <laughs> God. Such propaganda. It's like we're in Soviet Russia or something. <laughs> Vladimir do not want to cut its bad things. If you cut, the Congress is the one who passed the laws and put sequestration in place. You don't want to do that. It's bad. We, you know, we come from the USSR. It's okay. We, we will do. We, you give me sister. I will take out the date. <laughs> Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel rolled out key details of Pentagon's fiscal 2015 budget proposal Monday. Some highlights, the first ever rollback in basic allowance for housing, a military pay raise that would match last year's 1% hike, the lowest in volunteer era, massive cuts to commissary subsidies, and potentially increased health care fees for both active duty families and retirees. The official also addressed scrutiny the Army is facing over a decision to transfer all of the National Guard's AH-64 Apache attack helicopters to active duty. The National Guard leaders advocate the members of Congress have called the move unfair, but the senior official cited a different statistic, one that shows the Guard is making some gains under the budget proposal. When it comes to manpower, we're going to cut active army disproportionately to the guard, the official said. The army is moving from a force that's 49% active duty and 51% guard and army reserve to 45% active and 55% reserve. The official also blasted a bill in Congress that would stand up a commission to study the army's future force structure, a move that guard officials have said they support. The bill H.R. 3930, sponsored by Repu uh, Representative Joe Wilson, Republican from South Carolina, would establish a national commission on the structure of the Army and prohibit the Army from divesting, retiring, or transferring any aircraft from the Army National Guard? It would stop any end strength reductions in the Army Guard at 30, 350,000. The commission is an easy way out, the official said. It's saying, let's kick kick this down the road, and it'll, and it'll say you can't cut the guard. What kind of language is this? And if you can't cut the guard, we'll have to cut the active. That's like some sort of, like, fucking hoorah song or something you're supposed to sing, I guess, you know, when you're... When you're doing like a fucking like 50 mile road march, it's just saying let's kick down the road and I'll say you can't cut the guard. You know, they're supposed to be hoorah and you know, you can't cut the guard, we'll have to cut the active. You know, like some sort of hoorah banner or some shit. The official cautioned against too much focus on the cost of active army versus the cost of the guard. In most cases, the National Guard is cheaper, and that's if you don't have to use them, the official said. You've got to have balance. But that's how they ended this article? You gotta be shitting me, and there's no comments? What the fuck is going on? But uh, I'm so confused. What the hell is going on in this country? I swear to God. And they let these people talk out. Uh, and, and, you know. Uh, oh, God. We're in Soviet Russia. I swear to God. <laughs> well, that's from, that's from Military Times Roulette, I, I guess. Uh, yeah. I, I guess uh, that's some... Great reporting. Let's do a Pharrell Jundi uh, roulette. I always say go to somebody who's got awesome reporting, and uh, I really uh, appreciate Matt and them from uh, Pharrell Jundi. 
industry talk. The UN talks shop about their use of private military security companies. Last year, July 1st, uh, July, I, I, speaking Matt, wrote about the debate the UN was having about its use of private military security companies. Now, under the future, this is the final review panel about this debate. And it's interesting to hear the current viewpoint of the UN. One of the things that come up and I thought was interesting, is the UN still does not know how many contractors it uses, either for guard work or for logistics. So I think they should at least dedicate some time and effort towards getting a firm grasp on this. Perhaps an online database that gives transparent view of everyone they're using, both past and present. They could also add to that database if the company was fired or not, or that they thought of their performance. Anything to add to the history of the use of contractors. They also talked in great length about the codes and conduct and other initiatives to get companies to self-regulate. My thoughts are that if the UN actually published violations of these codes as a record for the public, kind of what the POGO does with the companies in the U.S., um then that would keep the world and the UN better informed as to the true records of companies. That kind of history and track record is essential information if you want to truly find the best value company for the money. Companies would also fight to not be on that list, especially if it impacted bidding. The other surprising thing is that they couldn't list how much money was spent on contractors, past or present. So a database should absolutely list the costs so that member donors to the UN can see exactly how their money is being spent. Also, the companies can see how much a service costs, and they can provide a service cheaper, at least get a feel of what it would take to spin up a contract. So a UN contractor database would be excellent investment. If the UN is interested in transparency and effectively using the industry... I was also taken aback when the panel was asked around the 2830 point in the video what they thought about the lack of accountability of member nation troops and continue to violate human rights during peacekeeping operations. No one wanted to take the question and it was left wide open. I thought silence said everything. There was also numerous questions about the definition of mercenary and how it applied to PMCs or how their group was called the UN Working Group on the Use of Mercenaries and yet they they were tasked with evaluating PMCs that were not mercenaries by definition. I think the choice of the group title was somewhat counterproductive for such a panel. If they wanted to be perceived as objective in their research of this industry. With that said, the group at least tried to differentiate between mercenaries and PMCs. In the video below does not show up. Here's a link and he linked it uh, below. Yeah, Pharrell's pretty badass. Matt and them are pretty awesome with uh, throwing down decent uh, decent information. Um, the reporting on stuff within the industry of uh, contracting, it's, it's pretty awesome. I mean, there's not really uh, decent resources. A lot of the websites that I see don't really post uh, fairly often enough and don't have even objective... Um, viewpoints either, even if you work in the industry. So, you know, being objective and putting out your own thoughts I think is highly important because you can always put out stuff, you know, oh, these guys are awesome or these guys are bad, but, you know, having an objective viewpoint within contracting is always, is always a good plan because, you know, you can put out the truth and not just be beholden to whatever either your employer wants you to or, you know, whatever the industry wants you to put out because that's total bullshit first Ubuntu phones go on sale in fall Mark Shuttleworth reveals oh, I didn't know uh, Mark Shuttleworth was a fellow bearded traveler it's pretty legit Barcelona, Spain. The first Ubuntu phones will launch in autumn and will be astonishingly great in some areas and weak in others, but the software outperforms Microsoft, according to Ubuntu founder Mark Shuttleworth. 
Ubuntu-powered versions of Mixu, MX3, and BQ Aquarius smartphones will debut in the third quarter of this year. I sat down with Shuttleworth, the face of the British company, Canonical. Canonical's British? The people behind Ubuntu at the phone and tablet extravaganza Mobile World Congress, where he revealed why Ubuntu is launching with partners Mitsu and BQ. Our first generation of phones will be astonishingly great in some areas, Shuttleworth explained, but will come across as weak in others. So if we get them into the right hands, people can celebrate the ideas we're really great at while we buff up at the app catalog and improve in other areas. We have 650 apps in the App Store, 650,000 applications in the App Store. So we'll get the phone in the hands of people who don't care about that. Oh, no, no, we won't have. Okay. So why Mitsu? Mizu? I'm not sure you're supposed to say that. And BQ. Names which may be unfamiliar to many phone fans. We are at at board level and quite a few household names, said Shuttleworth. But with much larger institutions, we're going to be a smaller part of the strategic picture when we launch. So we wanted to go out with two companies that are the right size to make material commitment. Also, we are two companies that are very passionate about placing the right devices in the right hands. Companies that are established at getting into difficult, entrenched, or congested markets with something that feels fresh for the right people at the right time, and both of them have that. BQ in Europe has been has taken good share of concentrating the design and knowing very clearly who they're designing it for, and then being very then thinking very carefully about the retail strategy. And Misu in China, they've really cracked into the market by building loyalty, and they've identified a particular segment, and they've really and they've been really great at working to do something those guys are passionate about. They call the segment digital lifestyle, typically younger, typically edgier, and typically more conscious of what's new and cool, and less likely to buy from a bulk manufacturer. Well, that's actually a pretty interesting comment. The two phones will be available in order from anywhere in the world, but they'll be built by local rather than global brands. China is super important, Shutterblush said. Europe is interesting as well, and we have carriers in the U.S. We'll focus on these two markets, these two manufacturers for this year and this launch. What do the phones offer? Offer the hardware is pretty stand is pretty stand out. He said both companies have access to pretty top notch design and manufacturing, and they care about it. What you care about goes into the product, and both of them really care about the feel of the device. I think that'll be outstanding in several areas of the UX. A lot of people say, compared to Android, it feels really beautiful compared to Firefox. It really feels fluid and fast, so I think we'll stand out. And how is Ubuntu's encouraging the app situation in the meantime? We make it easier for de app developers that care about Ubuntu, Shelworth said. If you care about something that's hard, you can't do anything. If it's easy, you can do something about it. We've refined it so any app developer team can have one or two people who really cares about Ubuntu. And we've done that by looking at the tool sets people use to develop Android and iOS and make sure we're well lined up to make it easy to use those tool sets. We're perfectly aligned with Google and Apple. So if you've got HTML5 app that works with Android or iOS, it'll work with Ubuntu with only a tiny amount of friction that just one person can take care of. In the native applications, we've got pretty good traction in gaming because lots of the game gaming companies are targeting Ubuntu. In productivity apps, we're looking into ways to make it easy for Android apps to come to Ubuntu. And we've got a big catalog of applications that are Java, Java apps and Linux apps. This is a pretty extensive interview. This is pretty sweet. This is from Rich Trenholm. Uh, 
first Ubuntu phones go on sale in the fall, Mark Shuttleworth reveals. This is pretty sweet. Now, if you're not familiar with, with Ubuntu, it's uh, another operating system like iOS or like um, Windows. Um, think of your microwave, probably your toaster, probably your um, wireless phone inside your house, uh, most likely your oven. Name something that you use every single day. It runs on Linux. Android is Linux. It runs off of SE Linux, which is a kernel-based uh, system. Pretty much everything that you use runs off of Linux. And if you're not very familiar with it, you don't use it very often, you should give it a try. You can always... Um, I say the first thing you should probably do is just go get like one of the uh, the CDs on Amazon. Just buy a Ubuntu CD off of Amazon. And get your, it'll get you real quick. If you're like you're overseas or something like that, and you don't have the ability to make your own. Just you know buy one and get it, and then boot it off your uh, off your S, your uh, CD ROM drive, and you'll be able to run. If you can get to your BIOS and change your boot order, you can just you know boot from your uh, your CD ROM. You'll be able to boot from it, use it. And uh, you know you don't have to commit to it. You just run it in your uh, run it off the CD, and you know if you like it, that's something that you can use. Um, what's interesting is that a lot of the uh, same applications that you use with uh, any of your operating systems already run with um, with Ubuntu or other Linux app uh, distributions, and there's many many different types of Linux distributions there's hundreds of thousands of different types uh, the super super small ones that barely can do anything to the really 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 big ones that like Ubuntu or Red Hat or you know, any of those distributions that are able to run full scale studios and your your uh, air traffic control towers you name it Linux is running it and uh, it is really interesting that the kind of things that you can do with uh, with people who actually give a shit about what they're making, it's a uh, it's pretty interesting. After this uh, this episode, I'm gonna be playing a band called The Kid Crash. Um, I emailed uh, The Kid Crash, and uh, they uh, showed me some love actually. Uh, I emailed them, you know, asked them if I could play their music, and, uh, they've, uh, they've been a band for a while, um, I'm not exactly sure how long they've been a band, to be honest, um, going on their band camp, I forget what album... My favorite song from them is Wound Eraser. Um, that's just a really cool song. Um, they just have a different way of playing things. They're on the math rock-ish side of things. Um, they really have a passion for what they're playing, and you can tell with the way they, they do things. Um, each note and each, uh, it's just different sounds, just have a, just, they, they know exactly what they're doing, um, I find it really interesting, like, I've never really heard a band like them, um, here's a review by, uh, punknews.org, I guess, yeah, I guess they're emo, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> They're math rock. But lately for me, emo has been getting keeping me pretty busy with some of the most passionate, overall rewarding music I have set my ears to listening. And a lot of that can be credited to a little album called Jokes by a little band called The Kid Crash. A few years back, they released New Ruins, a pleasurable little record that flirted with both Midwest indie emo, highly technical math rock, and punk pop. But what was lacking on New Ruins was an overall push, a key feeling of emotion and intensity that can really make the band. The push was goaded into the band for their second release, Jokes. 
The first thing to say about jokes is the overall transformation the band went to create the record. Gone are the charming, almost... This is a really long word. <laughs> scene bands-esque that would blow away Motion City soundtrack vocals and replace with dense, incredibly passionate screams. Gone is the deadpan, boring rhythm section, and in its place is a frantic explosion of purely technically and steady beat that's not hard to follow. On the level and on the view of the record, they're a totally different band. But to the extent that they're not all that different, what can be regarded as kept as the band's technically, if anything, technically is an entirely new level. The guitarists are jumping off the wall in impressive dynamics and have the energy of a sugar-high nine-year-old. <laughs> and songs like Life Was Real, Vital, Urgent, and Important, Burn Guts, the band can barely keep with themselves, keep up with themselves in terms of dynamics. What separates them from most bands is the amount of emotion they'll put towards their playing. I don't think we've seen so, so much introspection for, in a band with so much technicality. The dynamics between the clean tones and the all-out chordal aggression seems to be limitless, and it gives so much more space to expand and derive further into their chill parts, which are one of the leftovers from the New Ruins. And while the parts of this record are much more heartfelt than emotional, there is no denying the ultimate truth of what's left over of their Midwest indie days. Rarely does a band carry out a riff too long, and if they do, they carry it around by putting it in different keys and tones. What's probably the album's med meditation is the epic Ron Gosley's Fucked Up Dream, a heavy dynamic of a song that keeps changing and progressing from heavy to light to technical for over eight beautiful minutes. The band jumps from fast-paced technicality to intense riffing and screaming to beautiful breakdowns filled with twingly guitars, all while keeping a passionate, cathartic approach that most bands lack. Every piece of instrumentation, instrumentation is right on target, with the band hitting note after note beautifully, and keeping everything lush and on track. The screams were subtle, but overall very effective. They're back in the mix, but the singer seems to be screaming to fight back the slightly subpar production. As a whole, it's an excellent manifestation of the, of the album. Freshness is something lacking in today's scene, as bands seem to be overusing boring cliches in an attempt to create something of the old days, but alongside The Circle Takes a Square off Minor and Gospel, The Kid Crash creates some of the most refreshing music any scene has ever heard. Wow. The guy knows what the hell he's talking about. He's a good, decent writer. I'm a fan. I found about The Kid Crash from a buddy of mine, um, Jesse. He's in a band um, called The Cherry Cola Champions, which we played and I think the second episode of Death Metal Chronicles um, he got me into math rock maybe 12 years ago while he was listening to like Bear vs. Shark and um, A Sweet Mort and oh gosh what other uh, I think he was the one who got me into Look Mexico also and a couple other bands so, like, the math rock scene is a, is a bunch of different types of styles of music, um, where you've got, you know, Angel Vivaldi, which we played before, which he's an amazing gentleman, um, very technical math metal, to then, like, math rock, like the Kid Crash, where you're taking orchestral style of music, turning it into rock, using technical styling of playing, and going with it, um, which I think is is important for me as a musician because you can listen to, you know, whatever crap you hear on the radio, but it's just boring and there's nothing going on. There's no passion to it. It's just fucking music that some guy made you write, which I think is a big difference between the Kid Crash because also they've been unsigned for a while, which I think is very important to how they're able to produce the music that they come out with. Um... To my knowledge, I don't think they still have a 
uh, label or not, or even if it is a label, it's just someone that distributes their music. They're not um, under a copyright or anything either. So um, that's been interesting to me because uh, before you were able to go on Dunavali, I'm not sure if you still can or not, um, and download their music directly. I, I tried to. I'm, uh, I'm not sure if I did or not, um, but Dunavali was one of their old uh, labels, and they hosted their music there, and you could just go on there and download it. Um, but I'm going to link uh, to the, their, uh, their pages to download their music. Um, I think you might have to pay for it, at least on Bandcamp, for sure you have to pay for it. But I'd pay for it. I mean, hell, it's, it's good good music, and they're a fantastic band. Um, and they spent the time to send me back an email, so that's pretty sweet. And I don't get paid for playing their music, so... Uh, something I was holding off on talking about in Death Mall Chronicles was, uh, living with injury. Um, if you're a contractor or you're a, uh, in the military of some sorts, you should have a plan just in case shit goes down. Um, whether you get sick, like an illness, uh, whether you injure yourself, um, that's six months ago. Uh, I was deployed uh, to uh, the Middle East, and I was just uh, doing my normal thing. Got done with work, went home, back to my uh, my Conex uh, semi truck trailer, basically thing where we all lived, and uh, went back to my place to go to chill and you know sleep wherever and. I noticed my uh, my knife had cut me, uh, just nicked my my hand wherever. So I uh, pulled out the knife and uh, it was like jammed in the the Kydex sheath that it had. Uh, it's a polymer sheath that you know it's a fixed blade knife uh, some, from Spiderco. Um, it was a Spiderco mule, and uh, it was jammed in the sheath. So I pulled it out, and when I pulled it out, I you know yanked it out with all the force that I had and ended up severing the tendon in my uh, my pinky. Uh, the first and second ten of the LDP and the LTP, if you know what those are. Um, first and second, and uh, wrapped it with a towel real quick. Held it above my head. Had my buddy take me to the ER, and I. Uh, it's interesting, you know. It was kind of cool that we had an ER there, and uh, the guy, you know, was trying to work on it, trying to figure it out, and uh, they shoved me with a bunch of drugs and. And uh, they couldn't really do anything with it because he noticed that he's obviously good enough for doctor that he knew that it was a severed tendon. And so uh, I ended up having to go from, I had to wait until the next day to go to another base and uh, went to the other base and had them, uh, I had to go there with my program manager. And uh, this is like your, basically like your commander, pretty much, if you're not a contractor. This is like your commander, basically, and at that level. Uh, and uh, that person took me to um, took me to the hospital, which was a military hospital. Uh, it was a really, really, really big one. This is a, you know, billion-dollar facility um, that the military has put all this money into. <laughs> which will probably be torn down in the next couple of months. <laughs> but uh, it took me there, and I had to just kind of, like, wait around. I waited for about four or five hours to find, or, you know, if they were going to approve me to get a treatment, you know, or they're going to send me away, and I have to go to, like, Germany or some shit. And uh, thankfully, there was actually a uh, a hand surgeon that was there. And, uh, the only hand surgeon in all of the country that I was in and for the military. And so he was like, fuck yeah, we're going to do it. Go into the place, get all your vital signs. They, they took all the blood they had to take. They did all their thing, pumped me full of drugs. I don't even know the names of the people that worked on me. And I woke up seven hours later and they had like, there was nerve blocker, you know, and, and, uh, so like, you know, you try to like go, you know, you try to like move your arm and because you wouldn't have control of it, it would like hit you in the face. <laughs> like hit myself in the face like seven times as soon as I woke up because <laughs> the nerve blocker was so fucking hilarious. 
<laughs> and uh, Simon was there probably for another four days or so, and they didn't know what they were going to do with me, you know. <laughs> They didn't know how I was going to go home or whatever. They didn't really have a plan, at least the company that I worked for. And and, uh, they sent me home, and that was that. And uh, now it's been six months later after uh, therapy, and I ended up having to get another surgery three months after uh, they found out, basically, that my... uh, my pinky had like a bunch of scar tissue or whatever and I couldn't actually uh, make a fist or anything like that and so they did another surgery they took out a bunch of scar tissue and uh, basically my hand is for now crooked or at least the fucking finger or whatever but it's an eye opener for you contractors out there um, and other and soldiers as well you know to have a plan you know what will happen if you get injured and what processes that you have to be able to take care of those problems. Um, as well, you know, what happens when disability runs out, when you've got no more money? And what if your company doesn't have a position for you because they've eliminated your position or, you know, whatever goes on with that? Put that, you know, into your mind as well. You know, have a plan of action. Because if you don't, you're going to end up like this guy and not know what the hell is going to happen. Um, and it's important, you know, God forbid you have children or a wife or even some, you know, some girlfriend that you're with, that you're living with, you know, and you're paying two grand a month for rent or whatever, you know, um, put that in the back of your mind as well. You know, come up with a plan of action, talk to your lawyer, uh, talk to your company to know exactly what happened if you got hurt. That's the one thing all of us brush over. You know, even even these companies try to push, uh, you know, Cigna insurance or whatever type of insurance where you're paying, you know, five hundred to thousand dollars a month on insurance. Well, what's going to happen when you actually have to utilize that insurance? You know, and is the military going to cover what you what you're going through? Um, it's a big fucking deal, you know, and it's very taken lightly within the industry. It's like people can send you to these god awful fucking places. And, God forbid, you fucking lose a leg, uh, get shot in a leg, uh, <laughs> sever your finger because you cut it with your own knife. <laughs> you know, so, that's, you know, my part is, you know, well, I lost, uh, the ability to be able to, like, you know, just do something simple, like, pick up, uh, you know, a kid you know, who's maybe only 40 pounds, you know, that was an interesting thing for me, with a lady friend of mine, she had a child, and, you know, the, right after I had my surgery, you know, it was like, you know, trying to, you know, pick up her kid, you know, it was something that was, wasn't something I was prepared for, you know, and, and that was a, a big deal, I was like, make sure that you have a plan, you know, especially talk to your lawyer as well, have that person look up, you know, either on the military side, what, you know, what, what repercussions are there, or with contracting, make sure that you have a lawyer who actually understands Defense Base Act, DBA law, you know, which there's not a lot of lawyers out there that know what the hell they're talking about either. Um, you may not need to use a lawyer, but you definitely need to have one just in case that that person is allowed to speak on your behalf as well, because they may or may not have a clearance, so that also matters as well. Um, I'm going to end it there. It's been Death Metal Chronicles. This is uh, Friday's Friday show. Friday the 28th. I hope you guys have an awesome weekend. And if you're embracing the suck, I hope you listen to some kick crash. And, uh, if you're running some, some convoys or the fucking wind, be safe out there. And this is the